from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. Wonderful to be here. What a beautiful day outside. Last week at this time, three days ago, I was in Lanai, and it's very pretty in Lanai, but it's also beautiful to be back in San Francisco. Right off the bat, we want to uh, welcome our Vice Commodore, Adam Gamble is here. That's wonderful. Nice to have you here, Adam. And we have four uh, staff Commodores in the uh, order of seniority, Bruce Monroe is here, and John McNeil is here, and Hans Troenfels is here, and um, Paul Heineken is here. Welcome, guys, staff commenters. We also have the president of U.S. Sailing, Rich and Cecilia. Welcome to have you here, Rich. Great to see you. Good. Um, we also have... As you may know, Sailing Hall of Famers, we have Sally Honey here, Stan Honey here, and our speaker, Gary Jobson here. And in terms of Rolex winners, we have three Rolex victories here. That is to say, we have Sally Honey's first Rolex win in 73, and her second Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year in 74, and her lacquered husband, Stan Honey, who only has one Rolex, darn it, what a family, in 2006. Good on you, Stan, buddy. <laughs> and as you know, Gary is also a past president of U.S. Sailing. And if past is prologue, prologue and I think it is, uh, Gary's life exemplifies that point. At age 16, he was named the Toms River Yacht Club uh, Junior Sailor of the Year. That's at age 16. Well, that was really just sort of setting things up. He would go on, as you may know, to be a Collegiate All-American, uh, Collegiate Sailor of the Year three times, uh, go on to coach at Kings Point and then Annapolis, and then meet up with uh, a guy named Ted Turner. Somebody might have heard of Ted Turner before, to win this thing called the America's Cup in 77. And as if that weren't enough, they went on to sail in the Fastnet race in 79, who remembers how many people died in that race? The answer is like 15. They won that race. So uh, setting up a little string of victories. He would go on to write 23 books, uh, be in 1,200 TV shows, uh, appear at 2,900 Yacht Club talks, such as ours right now. Uh, he was only at ESPN covering sailing for 31 years, and this year he will be in uh, covering the Olympics. It'll be in Barcelona. Those of you who were here for a couple weeks ago know that Daniela Morose, uh, a six-time world champion, a four-time Rolex winner, will be the youngest person to ever go to the Olympics and the most credentialed, both, from the Bay Area. She's a six-time world and four-time mm -hmm. Rolex, and she did all that by the age of 22. She'll be there. Gary will be covering it for NBC during that time. While most people spend their life trying to win the game, our speaker today has spent it improving the game. Gary Jobson. Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you, Ron. That was uh, very nice. It's back nice to be here at St. Francis Yacht Club. I went looking for the bar earlier. I was going to have a gin and tonic before my talk, and it, it seems to have disappeared. So I hope uh, the bar, maybe by the Big Boat series or sometime in the near future, the St. Francis, the storied St. Francis Yacht Club bar will reappear. So, Ron, I'm going to follow Daniela very closely. We're hoping she gets a medal, preferably a gold medal, but a medal. And based on her performance in uh, the Princess Sophia last week, it, it looks pretty good. And uh, other than the disappeared bar, the club is looking pretty good, and the bay hasn't changed. <laughs> A little bit. And the uh, St. Francis Yacht Club has such a storied history with the America's Cup, going back to Tom Blackholer and, of course, Paul Kayard and John Kostecki and, and many over, uh, others over the years. It's kind of fun to talk about. And the America's Cup has sure changed a bit, hasn't it? I mean, I don't think that anybody could have foreseen foiling monoholes speeding around at 49 nautical miles per hour on the race course, but that's where we are today. So 
Last year I was here. I was here on uh, June 7th a year ago. And uh, I talked about the club and lots of things going on. But I have two topics today. One, a little preview of the America's Cup in Barcelona coming up sooner than we all know it. And a little preview of the Olympic Games coming up about a month earlier. So this is the first time I've done this talk, so bear with me. I hope you enjoy it. And I did bring some pictures. I'm going to start out with a little essay I wrote, a essay I wrote about the America's Cup. Now, normally I don't read things, but I got inspired the other day to, to write this. And uh, it gives you a little flavor of what the America's Cup's all about and why this event is important. So just pretend you're in the voiceover booth with me at NBC or ESPN. As I'm doing my narration, this is how it would go. Since 1851, the America's Cup has endured as a symbol of excellence. It's a unique sporting event that has evolved with the times, using ever-advancing technology and raced by the world's best sailors. The people who participate are highly motivated and passionate about the quest to win this trophy. These are people who are used to winning at everything they do, but in the America's Cup arena, victory is never assured. And that's why it has captivated audiences for the past 171 years. In the simplest terms, the America's Cup is a race between two sailboats. But being the first of those boats has been an enormous and expensive endeavor. Technological innovation is the key, and sailors must prepare for every conceivable tactical situation. During a race, decisions must be instantaneous and correct, because as we all know from that famous comment, there is no second. What separates victory from defeat? Sailors fantasize about boats that are technologically superior in every wind condition. There are a few cases in which the slower boat won because they outsailed the competition, but most often the fastest boat will win. The America's Cup has also been an emotional roller coaster ride for everyone that has played the game. Look at the records of the people who have played it. Very few have won more times than they've lost. It is that hard. I wonder what the cup sailors of the past would think about today's speedy foiling monoholes. My bet is they would have endorsed the technology and marvel at the speed. Yep, the technology changes with the times, but the basic human instinct to excel is unchanged. I've just completed a new book. It'll be out this fall called The Characters of the America's Cup. It's a 193,000 word narrative about the drive of 56 people who have competed for the cup from 1851 right up to present day. Tom Blackler and Paul Kayard are in the book. The common denominator of all these people and the many thousands of others who have participated in the America's Cup is that they've all, they're all the same. They want to win. They put everything they have into achieving that goal. Someone once wrote that the America's Cup is a synonym for things brave and big and famous. To those words, I would add one more, spectacular. No inanimate object is more beautiful than two America's Cup yachts racing bow to bow, sailing for glory and into our affections. And that's the way the America's Cup is and will be for a long time. That's my essay. So, thank you. So, the America's Cup, the 37th defense of the America's Cup is going to take place in Barcelona, Spain. For the record, I think uh, New Zealand should be holding these in the Hiraki Gulf in New Zealand. But then again, Larry Ellison took the cup from San Francisco to some island in the Atlantic, <laughs> which is not in a US territory, I don't think. I think it's a British territory. But there we are. It's the site of the 1992 Olympic Games, where we in the US did pretty well in that games with nine medals in 10 different classes. It's a place that has some choppy waters and wind is all over the map. Yep, there's a lot of wind shifts there. And the waves and the wind are often in different directions. I've sailed there a bunch of times. But you're going to be able to watch just like you could here in San Francisco along the waterfront. And I anticipate a lot of boats will be out there in the water, hence chewing up the uh, waters a little bit more. And it's quite a cool city. If you've never been to Barcelona, it's definitely a place uh, to go take a look at that. 
Now, there is a sea breeze uh, that comes in, but the cup doesn't start till the end of August and stretches to late October, and the wind gets lighter as the summer passes by. So that old expression, the wind's not normally like this here, you know. <laughs> we might be seeing something like that. So how do you match your boat for the conditions that are going to take place in Barcelona when you're not sure what the conditions are going to be? Now, you might recall in 1987, Dennis Conner did a great job getting stars and stripes, the big, long boat, heavy, with lots of stability. The trick was getting through the light races in the early round robins off Fremantle to be prepared for the cup. But when the cup came along, longer, heavier, less sail area was a darn good formula defeating the Australians 4-0, which still does my heart good <laughs> after seeing the thing lost that time. So we're going to see the second generation of monoholes. And there's many one design components in these boats. But because it's a second generation, and foiling is growing, and people are getting used to it, I expect the races to be pretty darn close. But let's hope there's lots of lead changes and some exciting races. Adding to the uh, narrative, we've got a Women's America's Cup, very cool. We have a Youth America's Cup. And on top of that, there's going to be a J-Boat regatta and a 12-meter regatta. I mean, in the, the women's aspect, you know, I have a wife and three daughters. And I've been kind of watching what's going on with the females in our world right now. Cole Brower, I mean, she blasted Sail GP with far more interest on the Internet with her uh, race around the world. Very cool. Caitlin Clark, I think, is responsible for the giant ratings they got in uh, ba beating all the men's ratings and the NBA. Very cool. And then uh, my daughters are so excited. I, I can't believe on the Super, Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, my daughter said, hey, what time's that Taylor Swift football game start today? <laughs> I don't think Taylor's playing in the football game. Her boyfriend is, but anyway, but it, it gives you an idea of what's going on. And for this Olympics, for the first time in our history, dating back to 1896, we have absolutely gender equity in sailing in the Olympic Games with quotas, number of athletes, and number of medals that can be won. That's a first. And we didn't have any women's divisions in the Olympics, only dating back to 1988. So you come a long way, baby, as they like to say. So these boats are technological marvels that can go almost four times the speed of the wind. Just think about that, about how fast they are. Now, just for the record, I'm hoping American Magic wins. And I'd like to see the America's Cup back in the US of A. I hope nobody takes it to some far corner of the world and it takes place. But American Magic, I think it's fair to say, in 2021 was A, off the pace, and B, quite a disappointment after the big buildup. So my first question is, are they going to be better than they were in 2021? Well, to their credit, they uh, got the McKinsey Group to do a thorough study, and they came back with a lot of ideas on how to do better. There's two new Helmsen who I think are as good as anybody in the world, Tom Slingsby and Paul Goodison, both with Olympic gold medals, both with world championships in the laser class, and by the way, in foiling moths, kind of apropos. They seem to have adequate funding, thanks to Hap Fouth and Doug DeVos, and they have more efficient and better management. They've got an American-led design team. Last time it was a Spanish group that did that. I did spend a little time with them in Pensacola, Florida, and they are into AI, which you guys know a lot about, because just south of here, there's a little bit going on, right, in Silicon Valley. And uh, they've had two America's Cup 40-footers to train with, very cool. I was impressed that they won a preview regatta early, uh, late last year in Villanova, Spain, and not so good in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Interesting place to race, huh? finishing fourth out of six boats. Their skipper last time, Tara Hutchinson, will be off the boat. Terry's now 54, but he is the sailing team manager. Their new 75-footer was launched uh, just about two weeks ago and quickly put on a Ukrainian large plane and flown over to Barcelona, where they're preparing, and they'll be sailing sometime in May. And I like the fact that they got a strong bench, including Buddy Melgus, who's spoken in this room a few times, his grandson, Harry IV. So 
I think they're going to do a lot better. The format for this America's Cup puts an awful lot on being totally prepared. Just can think about this if you're going into regatta. So it starts off with a preliminary regatta in late August, and oddly, Team New Zealand, the defender, gets to race against the challengers in that regatta. Then they go into a double round robin regatta, and against, again, the Kiwis get to race in it. So there'll be six teams, five challengers, plus New Zealand, and that will give them a ranking. At the end of it, one of the five challengers is out. That's it. Doesn't seem like much. And then they go into a semifinal match where you have the top four. Sounds like our basketball tournaments last weekend. And whoever is the top score gets to choose, think about this, gets to choose which of the three teams they want to race against in the, sem in the semifinal. Well, there's a little incentive to put on the locker room door. If, uh, so they selected us as the weakest one, huh? Well, we're going to show them. And uh, the first team to win five races in the semifinals will advance to the final. So there's two teams now. And the first to win seven races will go on to the America's Cup against New Zealand. So the big question here is can one of the challengers, and like I said, I hope it's American magic, but we'll see, possibly defeat New Zealand. I'm not so sure, but we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The America's Cup final starts October 12th. I plan to be there. I've, sadly, I missed the America's Cup match in Auckland. COVID kind of killed that. But I've been to every cup since 1962 at the age of 12. So I'll keep my record going along. And I'm simply going as a spectator, which will be a lot of fun. So I did bring some pictures along just to remind you what this thing looks like. And uh, all right, so like I said, you need to be prepared to get in the first race. And one of the things that intrigues me about the America's Cup is if it's not going well, how do you adapt to do a little bit better? So little time between these series of racing that you got to be on your game. And emotions are going to fly. You lose two or three races in a row, what do you do about it? What changes you can you make? Now, on the design front, each team was allowed to test four different foil configurations on their 40-footers and then only build one configuration for the 75-footer and you got to scale the thing up. Sounds like a lot of mathematics and uh, engineering to me. And with the foils, simply stated, the longer foil you have, the easier it is to get up on the foil. The longer it is, however, there's resistance in it, and maybe you go a little bit slower. So shorter foils, more speed, harder to get up on the foil, and uh, maybe easier to stay up there. So that's a big question. How long do you make the foils what shape should it be? How much bend should be in the thing? Thinking of bend in the foils, yesterday I flew out from Baltimore, and boy, was it bouncy. I fly a lot, so I don't usually get too nervous, but how strong are those wings out there? And they get off the plane, another cover came off an engine yesterday. And I gotta fly home tomorrow. And there's gonna be a storm tomorrow night in Annapolis, I hear. Anyway, so going back, it's a big question, a lot of pressure on the designers. And once you have your foils for the 75 footers, that's it. You can't make a change. And once you unveil your boat, which will be happening in May, then you can't cover it up. No more uh, covers like Australia 2 had. So everybody's going to see what Jesus other has. And it looks to me, based on some early designs, that some of the design techniques from the little tiny moss, the foiling moss, have been integrated, and windage is a big factor here, and uh, having smooth flow. And I see things like the foil goes up on one side and the mass rotates at the same time, kind of a little cool thing. And then uh, there's all kinds of little tricks. You know, you can have some instrument steering the boat for you. Here's what I would do if I were the czar of the America's Cup. You ready? Deep breath. See, it can come in from eight rows back. I get rid of all the uh, computers and electronics and let the sailor decide when to tack and when not to tack and uh, to make the call. Yeah, you can have boat speed and wind speed and compass course and 
normal things that most of us sail with. And I would try to get the boats that's something that we can all relate with. So if I were the czar, I'd have only Americans on the American boat, only the French on the French boat. And the Kiwis can stay on their own boat. They seem to be on all over the place. I'd have the boat where the owner can actually sail on the thing. You know, I remember Ted Turner sailed the boat. He actually steered, but he was on the boat. And Harold Vanderbilt, we saw there, he steered his own boat. And, uh, you know, I don't think Doug DeVos and uh, Hapfouth are going to be sailing on their boats. I learned a couple things about these cool things. I learned that uh, Doug DeVos played quarterback at Purdue in football. So I interviewed him about it. I said, oh, you were on the football team. He says, I was. I said, well, did you play? And he said, twice. <laughs> <laughs> I held an extra point. Well, did you make it? Yeah. And I got in when we were up 35 to 7 against Minnesota. And I got in for the last four plays. So he was a quarterback. And then I, I always wondered how you get the name Hap. And he says, well, when I was a kid, I guess I was smiling all the time. So they called him Happy when he was born. And he's been Hap ever since, which is, is kind of fun. All right, so let's get to uh, some of the cool things. As I said, there's only eight crew. Four of them are spending their time bicycle pedaling. So it looks like hard work. And based on the crews that I met, they sure look to be in really good shape. They're cyclists, they're Olympic rowers, and uh, they're going to have to work hard to power up the hydraulics to run all this equipment and uh, keep the foils and being able to trim the sails. One of the curious things to me is that the Italians last time perfected having a helmsman on each side of the boat. So you didn't have to run around the back of the main sole and have somebody steer while you're trying to get the thing going. And they proved to be pretty darn good. Uh, Jimmy Spithill and uh, Francesco Bruni, they, they did it pretty well. So I think you're going to see most of the boats having two helmsmen and two tacticians, the same people. But here's the curious thing. So I'm the helmsman on starboard tack, and you're my tactician on starboard. But on port tack, you're the helmsman, I'm the tactician. So you got to make sure that the two people are in sync with the tactician and the helmsman, because you might have different styles. One person might be the attack match racer, and the other might be just sail your race, and let's go from wind shift to wind shift. So you got to be in sync. So coordinating that's a little bit different. I did a whole America's Cup as a tactician for Tom Blackall, and I, I always wondered what would happen if we had to switch places. <laughs> Tom, you steer on starboard, I steer on port. <laughs> you know, and, and which is your better helms in the port tack one or the starboard tack one, right? It's kind of an interesting thing that we'll be watching. There will be television coverage, but no deal has been done that I know about in the USA, so it might be a YouTube thing. And my one editorial comment as a consumer, I hope the commentators don't talk too much because I like hearing what's going on. And the Olympics, which I mentioned I'll be covering, I'll spend plenty of time. We'll have microphones on the top three boats in each class when we're up there sailing. Now, I don't know what Daniela will be saying to herself. <laughs> but if she says something, we'll hear about it. But in the boats with crews, it's kind of fun hearing these two and three word sentences and then interpreting what they're talking about there. So I, I, I have another book coming up. And for this book, I went back and watched all the television shows from 1988 through 2021 of the America's Cup Finals. So sit in, I was able to get in the NBC library and the ESPN library and get every America's Cup final race on a hard drive and then just sit there watching it. And at the end of each race, I did my write up on that cup. And it was fascinating to me to critique the television shows that I was part of and not part of all, the, all these years later. And uh, I thought ESPN did a darn good job. And Stan Honey's graphics really uh, helped the thing along the way. And if I had a criticism of all of it is commentators talk too much. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to try to be mindful of it uh, this summer. <laughs> all right, time's going by. Who's going to win? Well, I told you I hope American Magic wins, but I'm not so sure. So Emirates Team New Zealand sure looks good to me. They have an unbelievably good sailing team. Dan Barnasconi, the uh, designer, is definitely on top of his game. 
They're probably not as funded as well as the others. And uh, they got a long supply line. I mean, let's face it, it's a hemisphere away and 12 time zones. That's a long way to operate away from your home base. But I, I think they're going to be very hard to uh, beat, and they look good to me. Ineos Britannia did not do well in Villanova, nor did they do well in Saudi Arabia, but they do have a four-time Olympic gold medalist steering the boat. And let's not forget he was with Oracle here when they uh, did that amazing come from behind. Remember that? Yeah. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Down eight to one. <laughs> I'll never forget Jimmy Spithill walking into that press conference like he was, had the world at his fingertips down eight to one, telling the press, well, you're all lucky because you're going to get to write about the greatest comeback in history. <laughs> well, Joe Namath predicted that one time, and, but he pulled it off, and, and Jimmy Spithill pulled it off too. So I don't know. They, they have a great uh, second helmsman and tactician with Giles Scott, two-time Olympic gold medalist and uh, wealthiest person in uh, Great Britain, Jim Radcliffe is uh, funding the campaign. So, you know, we'll see. The, they should be good. Orient Express Racing Team with Frank Kamas, who Stan knows pretty well, they're new to this, but they've been uh, doing surprisingly well. And they're sailing in France, not too far away from Spain, so they'll be a little bit of a hometown favorite. Ernesto Berrelli back in the game. He sure looked good when he uh, challenged for the Cup in uh, 2000 and three and defending the cup in 2007 faltered a little bit in 2010 against Ellison but they're always a quality uh, group so they'll be strong Luna Rosa Parta Pirelli I'm glad I don't have to announce that <laughs> you know th think about this that group has been in in constant uh, has been going since 1998 and the Kiwis have been going since 1985 the same group updating itself, new generations of people, and uh, they'll be strong. So here's my early prediction. I think American Magic uh, is up against the Italians in the uh, Louis Vuitton Cup Challenger Final. At the end of the day, I have great faith in uh, Slingsby and Goodison. I like the fact that Terry Hutchinson had the courage to get off the boat and manage the team. I like that they got a smoother operation, but we, we'll see. We don't really know, but I hope they get there. As far as uh, that, I think the Americans are going to have a tough time beating the Italians in the Challenger Trials. So on the one hand, I'm hoping that the U.S. wins, but on the other hand, if I had my $100 bet, I'd probably put it in the Italians' window, but we'll see. And then the big question, can any of these groups possibly beat Team New Zealand? So let me preface this by saying, I sure hope so. I think the Kiwis have had a far long enough. But an interesting little trend, and this is, we're going to finish up, and then I'm going to two or three minutes on the Olympics. So in 1983, finally the Australians challenged for the cup and won. They quickly lost in 1987 to Dennis. Dennis got the cup. Bill Koch, uh, or Dennis defended in 1988 with the catamaran. That wasn't quite a fair deal, but he did. And then Bill Koch defended with America Cube. And then the Americans lost. New Zealand won it. They defended. And they lost the cup. Larry Ellison came along. or And uh, I'm forgetting one. Olingi won the cup. They defended. And they lost the cup. Larry Ellison challenged, won the cup, defended. And he lost the cup. So following that train of thinking, which might be a stretch, <laughs> New Zealand challenged finally and won. They defended the cup. So maybe it's time for them to lose. I think they're the favorite at the present time. So those are my thoughts on the America's Cup. Let me switch over to another regatta this summer, the Olympic Games, which dates back to uh, the modern games, 1896, which that year, by the way, there was uh, not a breath of wind all week long off Athens. And on the last day, the Meltemi came blowing through, and they never did get a race in, and no medals were given out. In, uh, in 1896. So we have a mostly very young team that's going to be representing the USA in Marseille. The, the racing is down on the coast. 
uh, not in Paris 2024. I don't think the Seine River is quite big enough. <laughs> and like I said, uh, I'm happy to see gender equity in sailing in the Olympic Games for the first time. So far, the U.S. has uh, qualified in seven classes. There's a last chance regatta coming up in about a week, and so hopefully our sailors can qualify for those last three, uh, but we'll see. There's different formats uh, for the windsurfers and the kiteboards and, uh, and the double-handed. The 470s and uh, the skiffs have a series of racing then end up in a medal race. The others have a quarterfinal and semifinal. It's a lot of confusion, but just tune in. I'll have it sorted out by the time we, uh, <laughs> we go on the air and tell all your friends we need all the rating hopes we can. Do you get an app for that? What's that? Yeah, you got an app for that. Yeah, you get an app for that. Well, there'll, there'll be an app for that. That's kind of a little rhyme there, app for that. So how, can, how will the U.S. do? So I think there are three classes that I think could possibly be top three. Starting with San Francisco's Daniela Morose. I mean, as Ron pointed out, six world championships, four-time Rolex Yachtsman of the Year, and she's 23 now? She's turned 23. Damn. <laughs> so for sure, she's in the running for a medal. It's always too bold to say a gold medal, but I think she's got a good chance. And last week in the Princess Sophia Regatta in, uh, in Palma de Mallorca, she sure looked strong. Probably should have won it, but she was over the line twice. That's bad. One time you get her throw out, two times not as good, so she ended up second. I think our skiff sailors, both women's and uh, men's, look pretty good to me. Uh, they had a great regattas in the Princess Sophia, and better yet, both of them, men's and women's, are getting better. Every time they sail, they seem to get a little bit better, and now they don't have the pressure of having to beat another American boat in there. So I have hopes that maybe uh, one or both of our skiffs can uh, get a medal. I sure hope so. The Ilka 6, this is a boat that used to be called the Laser. <laughs> Tracy Usher will tell us about this, but the International Laser Class Association 6, Ilka 6. So Erica Reinecke, uh is our representative. She had a tough battle with uh, Charlotte Rose and uh, I think Erica will be a top 10. To get to a medal might be a stretch, but sometimes in Olympic Games, things happen. People have the uh, regatta of their lives. The 470 class, uh, Stu and Laura uh, had a tough one in uh, the Princess Sylvia, but he's in his fourth Olympics, and uh, maybe they can be a top 10, or we'll see. The NACRA 17, I think it's a stretch to get into the top 10. The others aren't going to be in the top 10, sorry. So that's, that's kind of the way I uh, preview the Olympic Games and uh, more to follow on that. So that's my talk. Ron, you want to ask me some questions? <laughs> Wonderful. So. What the America's Cup and the Olympics have in common this year is foiling. Is the future of sailing foiling? Well, clearly there's, uh, clearly there's a spot for foiling as we're seeing in the moss and various uh, iterations of multi-holes and uh, the kites, the IQ foil kites that we'll see in the Olympic Games and uh, the NACRAs. So foiling seems to be with us. Boats going around the world at high speed. Stand. I have to ask Stan if he'd like to have been foiling around the world or not when you, when you won the Volvo Ocean Race a few back. So, so, yeah, I think foiling's part of the future, but it's an expensive part of the sport. It's a dangerous part of the sport, and it's not for everybody, and not all of us relate to foiling. So now um, we've got two topics, the AC and the Olympics. Let's start with the AC. Um, of the challengers, uh, you've given a rundown. What do you think the strengths of, let's, call, let's go from the, the top, let's go from the bottom up. So essentially, uh, what do you think their strength is and their weaknesses, or strength and their weakness? Well, I think every single team has good people on the design team. It's amazing how these people are allowed to go from one country to another. Like I said, I only have Americans working on the American boat. 
but there's this whole culture out there that have been fine-tuned through Whitbreads and Volvo Ocean races and America's Cup that uh, go around. So all of them have pretty darn good design teams. Plus, there's so many one-design components on these boats, it's going to be hard to get an edge. And that's why these foils are so critical. And uh, I, I bet when we look back, we, next doc, November, when we talk about the America's Cup, I bet there's some races where uh, there was a big wind shift or somebody hit an unexpected wave and uh, came off the foils and lost the race that way. And, you know, so expect the unexpected. Things are probably going to happen that we can't foresee. Let's look at How's the that for a dodge of the question? <laughs> So let's look at the design cycle. In 95, the IACC yachts were constantly being developed. This was a couple, two regattas in with IACC yachts. And we with Bill Cook deliberately waited, waited, waited and, until we had the last boat design with Mighty Mary. And instead of shipping her across on a truck, we flew her across, which cost more money, but allowed us to have what we call, calculated to be three weeks longer design time. And Mighty Mary was faster in the water than, uh, you know, than the main boat in the DC's boat. So in this particular case, um, what do you think the design cycle with you know, computational fluid dynamics is for foil designs? Essentially, it's way shorter these days. Well, it, it, it's very expensive making these foils. It's millions to be able to do that. And I'm sure the designer has been working overtime. Ben Ainsley, for example, teamed up with Mercedes-Benz with their F1 to Formula One racing team. So that's a lot of uh, technological horsepower that they're able to wor work with. And, you know, looking on their website, they have 116 people on their technical team. And I'm sure they're not doing it for uh, minimum wage. So Jim Ratcliffe's spending a lot of money on that. American Magic, you know, they're, they're, they're all good at it. That's why I expect these races to be closer than people... There's not going to be anybody blown out the back door. Luck will probably have a little bit of factor. And that's why I give American Magic a better shot than they had last time. Because I think that Slingsby is really good. He's probably the best at it based on what I saw in the Olympic Games and the Sail GP. And he was aboard Oracle when they did the amazing mm -hmm, comeback. Mm -hmm. But, oh God, it was 10 and a half years ago. <laughs> Could we possibly be getting older like that? <laughs> We're not. Um, so, you know, what, what I'm trying to say there... What I hope happens mm -hmm. is the sailor makes a difference in this cup. Even with all the electronics and all the computers out there, maybe and it comes down to is somebody does the right moves at the right time. So you've said that the design and the technology is going to be strong. Where are weaknesses? Who's got weaknesses that you can perceive at this early stage? It appears to me everybody seems to be pretty well funded. They probably won't tell you that publicly, but they seem to be doing pretty well. We don't know the strength of the design teams because none of us are on the inside. The personal dynamics between the sailors, getting that tactician helmsman relationship right, that sounds easy, but I think back of me and Turner or me and Black Hole are doing it, that would not have been so easy to uh, get that synced up. And we'll probably see some anomalies happen there. I think that that's going to be really hard. And then one of the toughest things is predicting that weather off Barcelona. You get a lot of wave. Uh, rebound mm -hmm. off the seawall there off Barcelona. I mean, it's a cool place to watch. It was cool in 1992, the Olympic Games, but it's going to be a lot of waves and a big spectator fleet out there and the wind coming off the city. It, it's going to throw some curveballs in the sailing. That's going to be tough. So you've been tactician to two of the most colorful people in the history of sailing. I want you to compare, you know, sailing with uh, uh, the mouth from the south... <laughs> With, with our boy Tommy, and, and talk about their squeal. Tack, tack, tack. I can hear Blackler if you were driving telling you, tack, tack, God damn it, Blackler is telling you to tack. Well, I think everybody in this room, including me, misses Tom Blackler. He left the world way too early at the age of 49, and then it was a great honor to race with him. And he sure was colorful. There was this one start we had aboard Defender, and uh, we closed Dennis Connor out at the windward end of the line, and he had to go tack and jibe. This is an 83, everybody. Right, tack and jibe away. And I still hear this pitching crackle of black hole or, take that, Dennis, in his high voice. It was really something <laughs> special. Well, look, both of them were gifted natural sailors. Tom, of course, was a professional sailor, and after his uh, 
brief stint with uh, combustion engineering, working for Art Santry and graduate of UC Berkeley. He ended up as a sailmaker and you know Star World champion. And he was great, and he was a gifted natural sailor. I don't think he liked the process of ta uh, practicing as much, where Dennis Connor just loved practicing. You know, his great deal was to have both mainsails up on the hook at 6:30 <laughs> in the morning. You know, Dennis, you could do this at nine. You don't have to do it at 6:30. <laughs> Ted did not like to practice. He was a better sailor than people gave him credit for. He was very good as a, a junior sailor. He won in Flying Dutchman. He won in 5.5 meters. But where he really excelled was in ocean racing because he was good at organizing a crew. And uh, that's where he really made his mark. Four-time yachtsman of the year, Ted Turner. Pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And Ted, we went to his 85th birthday party in Atlanta in November. He's not doing great. He's got a disease called Lewy body dementia, which is a combination of Parkinson's and dementia. He still knows me, and uh, we, we talk a little bit. It takes him a while to process it. I wish he wouldn't call my wife a girlfriend I had in 1972's name. <laughs> <laughs> so in those days, you had um, you know, multiple people on the crew with very specialized roles. With eight people on the AC boat, give us from the front of the boat to the back of the boat the, the crew positions for each. So there's only eight on these 75-foot foiling monoholds. Mm -hmm. And four of them have one role, to pedal like crazy and keep that percentage of the battery power up as high as they possibly can. That's it. Then you have four others, and two of them are alternating between tactics and helmsman. And a tactician, it's a tough role because you're on the leeward side right. trying to call it. You know, in the cockpit, at least when I was American Magic, there were six different screens to look at. So there's a lot, and it's hard to look around. You're low, windage is a factor, you're wearing a helmet, hard to see. So you got a tactician helms in alternating back and forth. You have this great title, flight controller. <laughs> really important. You know, Buck Rogers could not have come up with this stuff. <laughs> or or uh, Star Wars, or Star Trek. And, uh, and then, you know, somebody that's sitting there orchestrating and trimming the sail, sails, you know, a little tiny jib with the, you know, very cool kind of mainsail that goes around the, the mast and keeping on. So that's it. There's basically four people sailing the boat. So uh, the Kiwis at one point kind of mildly came close to it. They didn't cheat, but they basically had a template over the, and, the, and, the, and the computer would suggest a position for the blade and the foil to basically improve flight control of technology. Talk about what's happening with keeping the computer separate from driving the boat from the helms and driving the boat. Well, there's a lot of controversies out there. That's the QAnon asked. people are saying that, you know, the, the machines are driving the boat. I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, it's a tough thing. You're trying to get every advantage you are. You want to dampen down the foils and get everything tweaked just right. I mean, I think Ellison's group was pretty brilliant figuring out how to make that boat come up on the foils upwind mm -hmm. where the Kiwis never had a shot. I mean, coming around that leeward mark down there mm -hmm. and uh, going upwind from behind to ahead eight races in a row. hee, <laughs> hee. They Black Kohler getting, would have liked that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they remeasured every race because they kept changing little, iteratively tweaking the boat. They got better. Race. Yeah. You know, they had a little mechanism there, an attenuator somehow to trim out the foil and get everything just right. So a lot of that will be going on. The Kiwis, you know, they, they had a head start on everybody. Plus, they started out with the winning boat last time. You know, they're, they're going to be very hard to win. But, you know, did you know who's going to win the Super Bowl before the game? <laughs> I know it's a sore subject here. The Taylor Swift game I was talking about. The Taylor Swift game, exactly. So when it comes to I mean, to that's the, why we watch these things. We don't know. Why are the Kiwis good, really great? Well, like I said, the operation's been going on since 1985. So they have, a, you know, Michael Fay, the Peter Blake, uh, and the Russell Coots error, and now the Grant Dalton error, and, you know, Peter Burling and his buddy uh, Blair Took. I mean, these, these are really, really good sailors. I've... I've watched uh, Burling in three Olympics now. He's got two silvers and a gold. But he, you can just see he's a cut above. And, uh, and he's back. Look what he did to Jimmy Spithill. I mean, I, Spithill, he didn't know he was going 7-1 in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. He didn't know what hit him. 
Right. It's like Mike Tyson. You know, everybody's got a plan until the first punch comes. So these new sailors are all apparent wind sailors coming from Mars, where apparent wind is so important because essentially you can two or three X the wind speed based upon your ability to handle the apparent wind. Is that the future? Because foiling is the future, apparent wind sailing? Well, apparent wind, you know, the faster you go, the more apparent wind you make. And uh, I mean, that's one of the tr struggles that Danielle is going to have because she's not that tall. And uh, she's going to be against competitors that five foot ten or six feet tall, and uh, you know she's sailing at forty five or fifty knots of apparent wind. If you have any breeze going, that's going to be a lot of strength to do it. So, but she's so good at it that hopefully her shorter size will make up for it. And that's what I was so heartened because there was a bunch of breeze in uh, Palma. So that takes us to the second batch of questions about the Olympics. Um, form follows function. And so basketball players all tend to be tall and skinny. High jumpers, tall and skinny. You know, we remember Bob Cousy, who was short and amazing ball handler. When you look at Daniela, you say to yourself, she says, and she said here, she wants to gain like 23 pounds because the more weight she has at the angle she heals a board over, the more load she can take from the kites themselves. So are you thinking that early on she's so good that she has to make up for the fact that she might not have the optimal form factor? For well... I mean, based on her performance over the past five or six years, she's good at it. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, is it going to be a breezy regatta in uh, Marseille? Mm -hmm. That's probably not going to be to her advantage if it's too windy and she's up against six footers. So now give us a re give us kind of a review of the classes uh, in the Olympics, because we've got new classes now with male, female equity or male, female. So who give us each run down each of the classes for us so we can see. So we start with the Ilka 6 and Ilka 7, men's and women's. One-time lasers to people. Right. Yeah. I, 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 Old-fashioned, I still talk about the laser, which actually was first called the weekender. So uh, those are two classes, single-handed, men's and Men women's. And women, yeah. Right? Then we go on to the skiffs. The 49er FX has a little bit smaller area, just like the Ilka 6, the women's boat, and then the 49er is the men's boat. Great name for this part of the world, 49er. We recognize that term, exactly. <laughs> I thought it'd get more of a why, reaction. Why about Mon There's no Montana boat? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know, I, I think both U.S. teams look uh, pretty good to me. Then we have the uh, IQ foil, um, which, you know, on the men's side, we're not too strong. But on the women's, obviously, we're really strong in that. And that's kind of new. I got a bone up on my... Uh, commentary for that but those races you know they, they last four to six minutes that, that that's about it and at least in the windsurfer and there's men's and women's windsurfer the the races uh they have one race that goes between 60 and 90 minutes even though their races are going to be eight or ten minutes i mean they're, they're very short and then you have the uh, 470 which they change from men's and women to mixed mixed means co-ed or man and woman in the same boat mm -hmm. and uh that's, that's kind of a little bit of a different format. And they have more traditional races. Uh, they'll have races up to 45 minutes on their early races. And then uh, all medal races are 20 minutes long. There's, there's, and they'll, they'll be close within a minute of that going. And that's not long. A medal is on the line. And you got 20 minutes standing between you and the finish line. And you get two points for that. It makes it uh, pretty exciting. Then we have the NACRA 17, the foiling monohole. Uh, which is another exciting boat. That, that catamaran. Was, yeah, the catamaran. Yeah. That, that was, those, those past couple Olympic games, they were far more interesting, exciting to me than I thought. Yeah. You know, the tornadoes seemed to split off. You know, I, I remember in Athens watching uh, Johnny Lovell and Charlie Ogletree, they got a silver medal, but the boats would split. You know, they'd be about two miles apart. Right. Hard to cover that, you know, you want <laughs> it in the same water. But the Nacras stay really close uh, and they're, they're exciting boats. So I think that's all 10. Now, I was going to say, I'm quite sad, and here's my strong editorial comment of the uh, afternoon before we wrap up here. Stan and I and uh, a group of people at World Sailing really hoped and worked hard to get a long-distance race in a 30, 32-foot uh, double-handed mixed crew monohull on a long distance race of four or 500 miles. It was an idea that Sherman Hoyt came up with for the 36 games, which were in Keeler Bay in Germany, 
to have a long distance race in the Olympic Games in a keelboat. So we resurrected the idea and got World Sailing to vote 76% in favor of having it after the IOC suggested, we want you to be innovative and have the Olympics replicate the way sports are. And I think it's fair to say that about half of sailing in, around the world is in keel boats and long distance races. So it seemed to us that having one medal race in the Olympics in a long distance race with Stan's nifty graphics following, and you could race against them, you know, at three, how's my team doing here, you know, <laughs> try and beat them around the race course, or maybe we could interview everybody on board, would have been really good. But the IOC decided in its ultimate wisdom not to do it. But I hope we can, uh, and the French really wanted to have it. It would have been great off Marseille. They're so and, good long distance Yeah, races. well, they, they, of course, metal prospect for them because they're really good at it. So I was a little disappointed. Stan, let's not give up on the idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to keep asking questions and let's, when I see one around the room, and we have some on, many online too. Uh, Kathy Trafton, our vice chairman, tell us what questions are coming from the online audience. By the way, we're being streamed on YouTube. Every show is streamed on YouTube and also on um, Instagram, stfyc.wyl on Instagram so people can watch us now and, uh, you know, tomorrow the next day. Okay. Kathy. Okay, two questions coming in. I can set my mic off. Again. Okay. Testing, one, two, three. No. Just speak up. Testing, there we go. Um, so one question coming in from David James. What do you think about a match race where the boats never go downwind? I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh, you know, when I was going through my laundry list of what would make a great America's Cup, here's what the boats would look like. 100 feet, 16 crew, seems like a good number. I'm just making that up. But it'd make it hard for the crew. So 12s were. Monohole, non-foiling, and match racing. I, I kind of miss the elegance of the boats circling around at the start. Remember the expression that Jim Kelly had, the mating dance of the lead-bottom money gobblers of the 12 years <laughs> And, That's and, a good a, one. and a real match race, like I said earlier, we had one race with Courageous and Enterprise, 54 tacks and a windward leg, followed by 36 jibes. I'll tell you what, you make friends with your teammates. <laughs> it's glad we won that race. Cause that was... <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I mean, these boats tacked three or four times upwind and jibed two or three times downwind. Uh, I, 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 I want to see more action. And there's no extra sails that go up. Right. You know, when the spinnaker go up, you, somebody gets a wrap. You know, I, in my lightning, I got a wrap on my spinnaker. You could relate to it, in other words. Yeah, totally. Okay, so that sort of goes into another question by Gordon J. Smith 1. Um, Gary, many would want the AC to return to the 1980s or 90s, or even to a century back in history, yet it is the AC deed that has brought us to this point in time. What do you wish for? Would it be cool to sail on Reliance? Yes. Yeah, 214 foot mass with 63 year best friends going up. I, that'd be cool. Look, it's a it's a technological competition. You want to come up with the fastest boat. That is kind of a fundamental in America's Cup. A friendly competition between foreign countries. Hence, the nationalistic part of it. I think is important, just like the Olympic Games. And you know, computers are helpful and nice. You know some I like driving my car. I don't want somebody driving the car and sit there and, whoa, where are you going? Can't you pass him, you jerk? Oh, I'm yelling at the computer. So that's, that's what I would do. Less computers, more people. So in, or essentially in the AC, if it blows 18, 20 knots, are the boats going to go faster than 50 knots? They, could, they might go a little bit faster. I mean, there, there is an ultimate speed. We don't know what cavitation. it is. Cavitation. You know, for the, the cavitate. Um, under the America's Cup, uh, they won't start a race if it's under 6.5 knots, and I believe it's 21.0. They won't race over that. So that, if you know, that's about a 15 knot window. That's not much. Mm -hmm. In in uh, Fremantle, it was uh, five knots to 30 knots, which seems more. I, I like boats that can sail in 25 knots. I mean, out here in the big boat series, in 22 knots or 25 knots, it's pretty good. And, of course, in Fremantle, you remember the state, the sea state, for God's sake. So we practiced uh, with USA out here in um, 
the potato patch, black lawyer said, God damn it, we go over these waves, under these waves, who can practice like this anywhere in the world? Guess what? That's not happening in these new races, though. We're basically foiling above. And Stan says it's a smoother ride when you're on foils. Yeah, well, it is, but in, uh, in Barcelona, the waves can be five or six feet. And it can be quite choppy. And the waves don't come from the same direction. It's not that Because nice, they bounce, right? Right. They're, they're bouncing off the wall and confused. And then you had five or 600 spectator boats out there. They're going to move around and uh, chop up the thing. And you got this big city front with weird thermals. So there's, it's going to be hard sailing out there. We saw that in Valencia. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. John McNeil has a question. John. You know, Gary, over the years, the America's Cup, to my great pleasure, has gone through almost a wave cycle, where in certain years it's a boat race, and in other years it's a sailor's race. And one of the other factors is dominated. Mm -hmm. How do we get back to it? Because we're in a long, long stage here where it's a boat race, and it started with Bill Koch, who had the mm -hmm. tech to build the boat. We've never <clears throat> apparently got back to the point of it being a sailor's competition. Right. The pendulum seems going back and forth, and it sure has swung in the direction of technology. Look, this thing is too expensive, proven by the fact that there's only five challengers and one defender. Let's not forget that in 1987, there were four defending boats, and there were 13 challengers from seven different countries. So there were a lot of people enthused that, hey, maybe we had the hope of being able to win the cup. And there are five American crews in there. So only five teams from around the world tells me there's not enough uh, boats out there. So you don't want to be outspent and outdesigned. You want to have the hope of doing well and a sailor making a difference. Keeping the same boat for three cycles, talk a little bit about how that can help draw more uh, teams in the future? Well, the way the Kiwis and the British orchestrated this, that everybody had to agree to do the cup this time, to agree to stay in a foiling monohull for the next time. So even if New York were to win it, <coughs> they're got it, supposed to have this kind of boats again, which is a little bit too bad. Mm -hmm. Of course, if I got the cup... <laughs> You'd want to change the design right away. That was the old rule. Change we the love design. the foiling monoholes. This is great. The boats are going to be 100 feet long with 16 crew. We're all <laughs> crews, and it's going to be a four-mile windward leg and match race start, come in from either side. <laughs> exactly. Okay, we have another question. I think it's Paul yeah. Lincoln. Paul, uh, Paul. Gary, may not be answerable, but uh, how integrated is all the electronics? So you have a flight controller, and you have... Uh, the trimmer and theoretically a guy could be doing this on shore with all the information that's coming in uh, depending upon, and I'm wondering how much the electronics are talking to each other I think they are yeah. I mean I, I, I mean Stan honey had to leave um, but you know they're, they're constantly testing the envelope of what can you do and not do and Chris all this is top level secret and we won't know until after the cup hopefully people write about this later, but at what point, you know, are, are you playing a computer game? And it sort of seems close to me at this particular time, and that's why I'm not quite as enthused. I'm, I'm going to be in Barcelona during the Cup, so I look forward to, as I said earlier, to watching it. But I want the sailor to make a difference. You know, when I go sail my etchels, I got a compass, and uh, I have feathers, you know, telltales on my sails. And uh, if it hasn't, what's that? And, uh, and at the top of the mast, I have a weather vane. That's what my grandkids call it, the weather vane up there. <laughs> and that's about it. You know, and if I race, I'm, I'll be racing a, six, a Udo Vorwerk 66 this summer. And uh, we'll have boat speed and wind speed and apparent wind angle and a uh, compass course. But we're not going to have all kinds of computers telling me how far we are from. I, I want to judge it. And if we win, you look in the mirror and feel good. And if you don't, well, we'll try better the next time. But I like to sail to make but, the difference. Uh, one, one last little thing. In the pictures of the 40s uh, in Newport, it showed one with bowsprit and uh, uh, Jenniker of some kind. And there's apparent wind sailing all the time. Yeah, that, Are they actually using those? No. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that it was a 40 that you were looking at. They have these 
32 foot boats that they were sailing. I have to go back and look at the picture. Okay, now. maybe it is the third, but it, I, I was I just was surprised to see that. In yeah, the they're, they're not, nobody's setting any extra sails. There's, a, I think, four different size jibs, maybe even five, uh, but they sure look like handkerchiefs up there compared to this mainsail that's wrapped around and a lot of technology in the thing. So in 84, we won, we medaled each, each Olympic class. In 88, we did even better, and we haven't done as well since. Well, Tell in 84, us, we won three golds and four silvers in seven classes. In right. 88, we had five medals in eight and, classes. Uh, yeah, in eight, and in 92, we had nine medals in 10 classes, and the one that didn't got fourth, women's windsurfing. You, you so that's 21 medals in 24 classes in three Olympic Games. The last three Olympic Games, we've gotten one bronze medal. Yeah, Caleb Is Payne. That the, the Caleb, Payne. You had? Caleb Payne, a member of our club. So that's to getting to the question. Give us three ways that we improve America's chances in the Sailing Olympics, improve our teams. Well, we certainly need some more funding for our Olympic sailors so they can spend a lot of time uh, sailing boats. I would try to get collegiate sailing a little more acclimated to our Olympic program. Online you know, with boat. Uh, well, we, we sail 420s and we sail flying juniors, and all the boats are equally matched. So you get good at starts, you get good at handling a boat, you know, mark roundings and tacks and jibes. There's no boat tooting, no long course racing, no international competition. And so you kind of miss out on what's so important in the Olympics with longer courses, and you better be good at boat tuning. And, you know, I, I hate to say this expression during my day which is always a dangerous thing to say. But the Olympic program worked hard at getting collegiate sailors involved in Olympic programs. I won the single-handed champs in 1972, and out of the blue I got a phone call from Harry Anderson saying, Gary, we've uh, got a spot for you in the Olympic trials in a fin, and uh, $300, it seemed like a lot of money at the time. <laughs> and uh, the regatta's coming up in three weeks, and we'd like you to sail in it. And I went and borrowed a fin and took my $300 and showed up in uh, Marion, Massachusetts and in 34 boats in the first race, I got 34th. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty harbor. But man. I got better every race and, and ended up winning the last one. So that was... That was, that was okay, so of, rule number one... So I, I'd get one is align, align collegiate classes with those... In well, the I, I, I kind of get college sailors acclimated to Olympic-style competition okay. and uh, try and encourage them to get in Olympic classes. They're the perfect age to do it. I mean, a lot of countries, they go to Olympics and then go to college. Our kids get out of high school, then they go to a, a great college. And we have really good sailors. They win the youth worlds, and then they have trouble after that uh, at the Olympic level. And it's because we spent four years in college, which is important, but we need to acclimate that. So that would be one thing. Two, I take a darn hard look at how some of these other countries are doing so well, Australia, New Zealand, the Dutch look good, the French look good, the British, of course, and uh, what can we do there? The funding would uh, certainly help out. And then another thing, which is a little bit controversial, but I'm a, sometimes I think we overcoach our young people, and uh, coaches do everything for the Opti kids, rig their boat and tell them exactly where to go. Right. And uh, you know, for my own career, I think I learned more from losing than winning you know, sometimes it's more important what you learn in a race than uh, how you finished in the race. And so make it, letting kids make mistakes and learn on their own, I think it makes you a little bit stronger. Question over here. Yes. So, Gary. Yes, sir. I want to ask Bruce. you about a name that's well known around here, Larry Ellison. He used to be a major force in America's Cup. But after he lost the last time, he picked up his marbles and started Sail GP, which has gained a certain level of popularity in the sailing community. What effect do you think Sail GP has had on the America's Cup? Uh, I don't think it's helped it. You know, some of the sailors, like Slingsby, have been sailing in it, so help, maybe that gets them a little bit tuned up. I mean, I'm I, I really not sure why Ellison and Coots, Coots is probably the driver of uh, doing it, went away from the America's Cup when their sailing careers were built around the America's Cup. Now they're trying to do an alternative to it, so it, I don't think it helps the game. But if the America's Cup 
got a boat that people could relate to, and got the cost down, it would, uh, it, it would thrive. And the, you know, sale GP would be another thing. But like I said earlier, I was fascinated that Cole Brower demolished the sale GP with uh, traffic on the internet when she, I, I want to meet her. More views is what your point is. Yeah. More I mean, views, she, more people public People really interest. related to that. You know, those little clips that I saw her, you know, she was compelling and fun and you felt her agony out there sometimes. Yeah, so she mastered short video format. That was she good. mastered what was going on with uh, her little little TikTok videos, basically. So she used this cooler communication vehicle to popularize her game, basically. Yeah, good question, wait, wait, Johnny Boy. I tried to Wednesday I, yachting luncheon. I, I tried. I missed her. Just missed her recently. But you'll hear her when I do get her signed up. We do have another question from the audience. Beth Diatley. Is that Hi. Beth? Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, when's women's uh, Olympics? Uh, not Olympics. Uh, America's Cup. America's Cup. Cup. Yeah. So that that's integrated in between the trials and the America's oh. Cup, uh, the semifinals, and I, I I'll tell you, they're going to get a lot of attention. Did anybody watch the basketball game? <laughs> you know, my whole family, Caitlin Clark, they were all cheering for Iowa. You know, where's Iowa? <laughs> but they like Caitlin Clark. You know, it was pretty exciting. Although South Carolina, they're just, they're all six Dominant. foot seven tall. You know, it's hard to compete against that. No, I, I think the Women's America's Cup is going to be, I mean, another thing that I would have on my laundry list of how the cup should be, yeah. I would insist on mixed crews in the America's Cup. You know, I don't see any, females on any of the six teams competing right now and if you had a boat with um 16 people maybe 25 percent mm -hmm. should be the other agenda i mean you could do mm -hmm. it 75 25 mm -hmm. either way mm -hmm. but at least have a mixed crew and that's why we made i'm quite proud of what we did with the olympics so you're going to be covering the olympics for nbc talk about uh what's going to happen you're going to have helicopters on the water how many helicopters tell us the total size of the crew and how you're going to handle the coverage so olympic broadcasts uh, services produces a world feed and all the rights holders around the world including NBC takes in all that footage in every sport they produce the pictures so I will be in Stanford Connecticut in a little voice booth with my two TV screens and uh, a computer with the analytics maybe there's two screens that I get to look at and I just talk about the races. I'll have the headphones on so I can hear what's going on in the boats and talk about it. So there'll be a helicopter up in the air with a Cineflex lens on each race course. And the top three boats each day will have an onboard camera. So we'll be able to, I'm not sure what we do with Daniela. Maybe she's got a helmet cam. She does have one right on her helmet. Yeah, I, that might be it. But the top three boats, that's who you get to hear and uh, see. So you want to be in the top three if you want to get a little bit more television. So they'll all and be that, equipped with the cameras, but you'll only drill the feed of the uh, top three boats. Is that what you three mean? Three boats. And then there'll be uh, three or four cameras on the water, all Cineflex, and then there'll be some long-distance views from land. Uh, we'll see how that is. You know, Marseille, it's a bay, so with a long-distance light, you probably can get some nice wide shots there. So there'll be good things. There's a director who's good at it, and I'll sink right in with them. Uh, you know, I'll be able to anticipate his next shot. And as I'm doing it each day, I get better and better at it. And they will get better and better at it when to do a replay. You know, you have a big collision to win or mark. Let's go see that again. <laughs> and sure enough, it'll, it'll pop up right then again. Look, it's in super high def, K4. Uh, it'll, it'll look good. I'm, I'm confident that the picture quality will have the uh, GPS graphics. So we'll be able to follow where they are in the race course. We'll do two races a day. There'll be about a 10 or 15 minute break in between the races. And after the live thing, because it's going to be early for you in the morning, probably 5 a.m., but then you'll be able to tune on, tune in all day long, you know, watch the replay so you can tune into the races. So it'll be seven hours. How far away, are, how far ahead of us are they? They are nine hours, right? What, six? Yeah, nine hours. Nine hours. Ahead. So if they start in two in the afternoon, yeah, that's five in the morning for you. I, I'm woke. I'm waking. I'm awake. <laughs> well, you just hit the replay. It'll be on one of Peacock's streaming services. Perfect. I'm so happy that it's not, not so much for me, but that sailing is going to be on TV, and we're covering all these races live. And of course, you know, I'll, I, in my commentary, I'll always make sure I'm talking about the American boats, and we'll see all the boats. They're pretty good at making sure that everybody gets in the images. 
And Danielle will be up front, so we'll get to talk about her. Yes. Wonderful. Looking around the room, is there another question? Peter, wait, hand the microphone, uh, Walter. Bring it. Okay. Gary, oh, wow. Gary, a couple of seconds ago, you said the uh, J boats are actually going to be racing in Barcelona. One, have they figured out the handicap of those things? Or are they level? Or are they going to one design? No, they're 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 level. They, they're going to they, be level. Yeah, they they go different speeds, and uh, you know the the J boats are curious. The owners don't particularly seem chummy with each other, and it's hard to get them. But they they go out and then they get their professional crews and push the boats harder than they should. They all agree never to get within a boat length, and they keep seeing collisions on the internet. <laughs> but it, but it's a spectacular sight. I mean, I the fact that they have the 12 meters there, the 12 meters date back to 1907. 180 of these things were built. 10 times the 12 meters were used in the America's Cup. So to have a 12 meter regatta in Barcelona is cool. <clears throat> the J-boats only sailed in the America's Cup three times, 1930 to 1937, but have five of them is a reminder to the glory of the past of the America's Cup. You know, as I mentioned earlier, at the risk of being overzealous here, I wrote this book, the characters of the America's Cup. It's taken a little while to get across the finish line, but all the writing's done, the pictures are selected, the layout is done, and it's going to a printer in a couple of weeks, finally. Uh, but it's so interesting, these people of different times and different eras. And I came away, as I said in that essay, realizing they're all the same. They're driven to win. Most of them don't win. You know, there's only been 36 winners dating back to 1851. And that's what makes it so compelling to watch the America's Cup. And I think this one will be a compelling one to watch as well. So people often ask, you know, which is tougher, winning an Olympic gold medal or winning the AC? It seems to me <laughs> clearly winning the AC is tougher. Talk to us about that. I think both of them are pretty darn hard to win. An Olympic gold medal or winning the America's Cup? Well, the, you know, both you have to train for a long period of time. It's based on a lifetime. Medalists in the Olympics tend to be younger. You know, it's rare to have anybody over 40. Buddy Belgus did it at 42, for example. But most of them are in their 20s or early 30s. Uh, where the America's Cup, the average age of a winning Holmesman is 38 years old. Buddy Melgus did it at the age of 62. <laughs> telling you how. Did you see the movie on Buddy Melgus, by the way? Yes, exactly. It was pretty good. How fun. There's one coming up on Ted Turner. Oh, that's great. Yeah, there, there's a series coming up on Ted. I've, I've seen five, five of the six episodes. It's, He's pretty colorful. Both he and Buddy are good for the game. Brent has a question. Brent. Yes. Can you tell us the difference between the America's Cup boats this time versus a few years ago? Well, the, <laughs> there, there's more one design components than we've seen in the port. There's going to be less time spent on the foils going there. The mainsails are uh, a little more fine-tuned going around the mask. You have a, uh, eight crew, not 11 crew, and four of them are just doing cycling. <clears throat> There's going to be a lot more uh, horsepower with the computers going, uh, and I think they're going to be closer in speed, hence the good racing. And, and the, the foil shape on deck, they're way, well, way they're, cleaner. They're, we, we haven't seen these boats yet. Uh, we're going to see them pretty soon, but there's going to be some pretty wild space-age designs of what these boats look like, and everybody's going to be anxious to see each other. It'll be too late to make changes. So it's going to be fun. All right. So um, I'm running out of speed. My longtime, my longtime friend, our house guest, and America and the world's best ambassador for sailing, Gary Jobson, thanks for sharing your insights with the Wednesday thank, Yachting thank Luncheon. You. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much, everybody. Wonderful.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.